Good morning. I'm excited you could join us for worship this morning. And the first time ever that we've had two live stream services 
on the same day. And we're excited about uh, some of how we're able to offer both of our styles of service and worship opportunities for all who are looking to engage with us. I'm excited that you've been willing to engage with us on a day that feels a little different than we had anticipated, much like this whole year has been different than as we've anticipated. But many of you know, because of some uh, ministry staff ex- potential exposure to COVID-19, we've uh, chosen to, to limit that exposure as much as we can. And so today we're uh, offering our services this way. We're excited how we'll still be able to worship God together, how we'll uh, be able to engage with his word, how we'll start our new series and see what God is teaching us through the gospel of John as we begin that this morning and are looking forward to that engagement as we're offering. And as a church, we exist to equip people to find life and faith in Christ and uh, love that we do that as we connect, as we grow, as we participate in what God's doing in our life and in the world around us. And uh, we're excited that we get to continue to do that in a variety of ways and looking forward to Uh, next week when we get to do that in person again. In a few moments after we've begun worship, I'll give some follow-up announcements on some of those schedule changes that are happening as we limit that exposure uh, to other people for health and safety reasons. But we're looking forward to all the things God has in store for us in this season. We're looking forward to how he'll use this morning uh, to, to transform us, how we get to use this morning to honor who he is as we worship together. We'll do that in song. Many of you may do that by giving digital as well, and we'll do that as we study God's Word. Before we begin that, though, I want to just open us with a word of prayer. Would you join me in that? God, we're thankful. Thankful for all you do for us. Thankful for our opportunity to engage in worship with you. We recognize that you're here with us, and our hearts are open to what you may have for us as we worship, fill us with your love, as we Uh, study, fill us with insight into how you're molding us into the children of God you long for us to be as we uh, engage with each other digitally or with those in the room with us, encourage us in our faith and to continue on. We pray that through all we do, you'd be honored, you'd be glorified, and your kingdom would grow and advance because of the time we spend worshiping you and listening to you through the study of your word. We're thankful for the opportunity and pray that it would be pleasing and acceptable to you as well. We pray it all in Jesus name. Amen. Well, and my prayer for you this morning as well as myself is, is very much what this first song is saying that says open up your open up our eyes surround us with your light your love endures forever. There's a scripture that's on the screen. I invite you to read this with me. You dear children are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world.
Jesus, open up our eyes. Surround us with your light. Jesus, there are so many things in our life where that we need to have your light turn on in that area of our world. So come have your way in us as we worship you at home, as we worship you wherever we're at today. Uh, we want that light to turn on. Come, Lord Jesus, come Holy Spirit. Invade our hearts, invade, invade our mind. Let the power that is in your name be present in our life today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as I said, as a church, we exist to equip people to find life and faith in Christ. I believe we do that best as we're connecting with each other in relationships, as we're growing in our own faith, encouraging others to do the same, and as we're participating in what God is doing in our lives and in the world around us. So there's uh, a number of ways upcoming for that to happen and some adjustments to some of the things that have been planned on what that'll look like. And so I just want to give you some of that information and encourage you to explore how you can engage in these ways as well. Uh, because we're trying to limit uh, potential spread and exposure uh, of things. The, the worship night at the barn for tonight has been postponed until we can find another date for it. And then the Wednesday night family night that was going to be launching our uh, children's and student ministries into their fall programming is going to be delayed one week. It's going to move from this Wednesday the 23rd to next Wednesday the 30th. Otherwise it'll go on as planned, just delayed one week um, for its start on to September 30th. One other event that was going to be happening here at the building this week was a number of women were going to be gathering on Friday night and Saturday for our district women's conference and that uh, that gathering in the church isn't going to take place but that was always an event that the content was coming digitally from the district so I just want to remind you if you've registered for that that content will be available starting on Friday it's actually available through the whole month of October so you can view that as you would like and still participate it with that way you can still register for that it'll be a great uh, resource for our women I'd encourage you to look into that as well. And if you are looking still to gather a group of women and watch that in your home, that would be a great idea. And so you can reach out to some friends and do that as well still. A couple of opportunities that are still available and getting ready to start. You can go to our website and find a number of our different small group leaders that are getting ready to start their small groups. And you can reach out if you have interest for one of those and weren't able to sign up last week. And then particularly, I want to highlight our women's ministry, uh, usually uh, on Tuesday mornings, but this year with a number of changes will be happening on Tuesday mornings. It'll be happening also in homes and also digitally. So a variety of options and a couple of different studies. There's information about that under the uh, adult ministries page on our website. And there's a link there for registration to whichever version of that, whether that's an in-home study and on campus at the church study or a digital study. Uh, because there's a variety of studies, we're actually asking this time instead of a bulk ordering that we'll do that you would order your books uh, on your own. But we've provided links available for the places to find those right studies for what you may be engaging with. So I encourage you to go to the website, find that registration link. A number of those options will be beginning uh, starting next week, as early as Monday and Tuesday, the 28th and 29th of next week. So I encourage you uh, to get on top of registering for those um, and engage with God in that way. And then also I'm excited that starting uh, in about two and a half weeks, October 7th through 11th, we'll be having our, our annual missions conference. Chris and Jamie O'Dell, uh, some of our ministry partners in Taiwan, will be in the States here spending time with us. They did their last service in Taiwan 12 hours ago or so with their church and will be traveling here. They'll spend a few months in the States here, but one of the privileges we get is that they'll be with us for that missions conference. There'll be a number of ways that you'll be in, able to engage with them throughout that time, and so look for more information coming in the next couple couple of weeks as we prepare for our time, uh, reminding ourselves of our partnership with them, of the impact God is having, not just here, but all around the world, and what it looks like for us to help that gospel go forward in places that desperately need more representation of it there. And so we're excited about that coming in just a few weeks here. Well, as we continue to worship, many do that by giving back to God some of what he's blessed us with. That heart of generosity is something God honors and uh, hopes for in us. And so uh, as you're able to do that, we'd love for you to, to give online digitally this week. If you generally give in person, you're obviously not here this morning, but uh, you can either mail that in or bring it next week or choose to give digitally. Any of those are great options as you may choose to do so. You can also give by text if that's something you're interested in doing. You can 
uh, text the number that's on the screen and it'll guide you through that registration. Or if you've used it before, you can just type give and then the amount that you would like to give and it will all be set up for you that way as well. Regardless of the method or uh, behaviors we have in giving, the hope is that our heart would be one of worship and that God would be pleased by it. And so I want to pray for how we would receive these gifts. Would you join me in that prayer? God, we're thankful for all that you've given us, most importantly, the gift of life that you've extended to us through Christ. And yet we recognize many other gifts as well. And as we take time now to give some of them back to you, we pray it would be pleasing and acceptable to you as an act of worship, and that you would use these gifts to spread your love and to grow your kingdom in a world that could desperately use more of it. As we continue to worship, not just in giving, but in song and in study, transform us this morning into the people you long for us to be, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Yeah. 
world. We run to you. Our refuge is in you. We hide in you.
Well, I'm excited today as we begin a new series, a series that'll take us through the Gospel of John in 12 weeks or so. We won't go through all of it verse by verse necessarily. We'll start that way today, but we'll jump to some of the more significant stories. As John says, they're the more significant stories that he's recording in his Gospel. Uh, I'll let you know a little bit on why I chose the Gospel of John, but I want to start with an illustration that will get to that point. When I was growing up, I had a variety of different meals that my mother would make that I really enjoyed. And one of the things I loved is that they weren't like a similar type of food. I enjoyed food from all around the globe, and my, my mother made food from all around the globe. And so some of my favorite mo- mo- uh, foods growing up were things like hot browns, something that's very normal to say in Kentucky. It's an open-faced sandwich thing that not many people here in the north have ever tried. It's just not a familiar food around here, but my mom growing up in Kentucky had learned how to make hot browns and that became a meal I really enjoyed. Uh, Being in the Navy, my dad spent some time serving overseas and so with the time that my uh, mom and dad lived in Japan, my mom learned how to make chicken tempura, like in the walk, the Japanese way and everything. And so at times for meals, we would have chicken tempura and that became one of my favorite meals for us to have as a family. In fact, at times uh, for different school events, I remember having to have projects in things like history or geography class, some kind of class. And we got to bring uh, cuisine from around the world as we had done a project. And so I brought chicken tempura to school to share, (coughs) excuse me, to share with my classmates as well. But my favorite meal, my favorite meal growing up, still my favorite meal, is Swedish meatballs. And when you picture that, you may picture Swedish meatballs with a, uh, like a white sauce or a thicker gravy on it. And when my mom made Swedish meatballs, it meant the meatball was a Swedish meatball, but we had a different kind of sauce that we would often put on it. But Swedish meatballs with mashed potatoes and corn and homemade rolls and gravy was my favorite meal. And I knew when that meal was coming because it took all day to prepare. It wasn't a simple, quick meal. Watching the meatballs be made from scratch was an all-day affair. And so you got to smell it throughout the day and build anticipation for what was to come. And so we didn't have it as often with how long it took to cook, but, but it was my favorite and still is my favorite meal. Those were complex things. I personally still couldn't cook you any one of those things. I've never learned how to make hot browns or chicken tempura in a wok, or Swedish meatballs. When I was a teenager and uh, started to get used in helping with some cooking some of the meals, I got to start with the more foundational, basic kinds of meals. In our family, that meant I got to start with cooking things or helping cook things like chicken and rice casserole. And I said casserole instead of hot dish because we didn't move to Minnesota until a little later in life. And so it was casserole everywhere else I was. And we had a variety of different chicken and rice casseroles. There were multiple different kinds of chicken and rice casserole. It's not a flashy meal. It's not a fancy all-day affair. It's kind of the basic foundational elements, the the rice grain and the chicken protein, to get a body what it needs. It's kind of the simplest form of cooking beyond frozen dinners or boxed macaroni. And so chicken and rice casserole was how I was introduced to cooking with just kind of the basics of what was necessary to get things forward. Later in life, when I started looking at nutrition and diet more seriously, one of the things that was fascinating to me is when you look at the elaborate diets or the specific diets of of top athletes or bodybuilders or things like that is very few of them are eating Swedish meatballs or hot browns or chicken tempura. But it is really common to find them eating rice and chicken usually some vegetables alongside that or maybe fish instead of the chicken. But it's the basic elements not just of easier cooking and simpler meal creation, it's the basic elements of a really healthy diet for those kinds of athletic pursuits. And when I was thinking of what series to do next, I, I was just realizing like it's been a long time since I've preached through a gospel or a large chunk of a gospel story of the foundational elements of who Jesus is. And so I wanted us to spend some significant time looking at who Jesus was. And the gospels are the best place in the Bible to do that. And as I was deciding which gospel to choose, I chose John because it's the chicken and rice of the gospel stories 
It's the chicken and rice basic elements. It's the simplest version of the way Jesus is presented in Scripture. It might not have the nuances like Matthew has of some of the depth of the Old Testament stories, and it might not have the elaborate parables that maybe Mark records or those, but it's the simple, basic elements. And as we're in a season of life where there's so much information coming at us, I figured a study on the simplest version of who Jesus is might be what's best for us. And so we're going to spend 12 weeks studying it. We won't go through it all verse by verse necessarily, but we'll hit all of its major themes and we'll go through it in order in that way. It was the last of the four Gospels written. And as John wrote it, he assumed that the people that would read his Gospel had already read the other ones. Matthew, Mark, and Luke were all circulating well enough that John could write things and assumed people knew context behind it. So for instance, he'll write about John the Baptist who's not yet in prison, and he assumes that means you know he's going to go to prison. In fact, John doesn't even ever tell the story of him going to prison. It's just something you're assumed to know from the other Gospels. We'll see that John will refer to the fact that there's the 12 apostles, and yet he'll never have listed them anywhere. He assumes that his readers know from the other Gospels who those 12 apostles were. As he starts to tell stories about figures like Mary and Martha in Scripture, he assumes your background knowledge of it. At times, even saying of someone like Mary that he's the one who anointed the Lord's feet. He says that before he's ever told the story of Mary doing that. He just assumes you've read and know those other stories already. And so he assumes familiarity. The question we may have is then, So why would John write another gospel? What was his purpose if he assumed the others were already circulating well and that his readers may have already been familiar with them? What was his purpose in writing a gospel? John actually gives it to us really clearly. It's near the end of the gospel in John chapter 20, but he says it this way. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. John is very aware that there's more complexity to be learned about Jesus, that there's more truth than what he encapsulates in just his book, and yet his heart's desire, the reason for his gospel is so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And that by believing, you may have life in his name. Our church's mission is to equip people to have and find life and faith in Christ. And John's purpose as he writes is that we would believe and then have life in Christ. And so I want us to spend some time studying it together. We get so much information that's bombarding us, especially in a season where there's a pandemic and injustice issues. It's a political election season. And so uh, everywhere we go, somebody wants to tell us the new thing we're supposed to know or believe or put our trust or our faith in. And during this season, I think it will be well served for us spiritually to focus on the simplest, clearest explanation of who Jesus is so that we can believe that he's the Messiah, the Son of God, and so that we can have life in him. Gospel of John is the the book I always choose if I know of a new believer and say start with this book because it's the simplest version of who Jesus is. It ignores some of the things that are in many of those other books. Not ignores them because they're not important. It just finds for the simplest understanding we don't need them. So for instance as we go through the gospel of John you may notice we don't see Jesus teaching in parables. It's not that John doesn't believe that happened. He just thinks the easiest way for us to understand isn't to have to go through the symbolism Jesus may be used. We don't see Jesus have any of his teachings or discourse on the end times and what that will look like in the Gospel of John. We don't see Jesus confronting or casting out any demons. We don't see him instituting any new sacred rituals. So the the Last Supper uh, communion experience isn't recorded in the Gospel of John. We don't see a nuanced discussion of his birth or his baptism. Because John's most clear hope is how we see Jesus as the Son of God and as the Savior of the world. And he assumes that we get some of the, the benefit of those details, those true things from those other Gospels. 
And so while some of those things aren't necessarily shown in the Gospel of John, there's some things and pictures we get to see that none of the other Gospels record. The stories Jesus is sharing in the Gospel of John aren't just the chronology and behaviors that take place. We see more of his interaction and dialogue. For instance, with John the Baptist or the woman at the well, with Nicodemus. We see great depth of the relationship and conversations John Uh, Jesus has with them, not just the actions that take place. We see that not just of his conversations with people, we see that of his conversations with God as well. The lengthiest prayers of Jesus are recorded in the Gospel of John and only in the Gospel of John, some of them, where we get to see what his dialogue and interaction with God the Father is like as he's dwelling here in our midst. We get to hear his heart's cry to God for what, what would be true of his relationship with God and what would be true of our relationship with God as Jesus is expressing it with his heart. Nothing that's in the gospel contradicts what happens in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and nothing that they record contradicts what happens in the gospel of John. It's assumed we would get a holistic picture from all of them together, but John is clear his purpose is the most basic and simple of them. And so in a season where we're hopefully rooting ourselves in the trustworthy revelation of God found in Scripture, but we're bombarded with lots of other information that's trying to grab our attention. Hopefully we'll root ourselves in the truths, the simple foundational clear truths of who Jesus is as John records it for us. Uh, We'll start today with the prologue of what that looks like and then over the course of the next seven weeks, John will refer to seven signs of understanding that Jesus is the Son of God and the Messiah and then we'll look forward from that to what Jesus says about who he is. There's a lot of I am statements that Jesus makes in the Gospel of John and so we'll walk through those together over the course of the next 12 weeks. When I tell people It's a basic foundational premise of their faith that reading through the Gospel of John is a good place to start because it's simple and it's clear. I always make one caveat, and that caveat is the Gospel of John is really simple and clear, except maybe the first 18 verses. John is the only one who, when he starts his story of who Jesus is, starts it well before his genealogy. He doesn't trace it back to Abraham or trace it back to Adam. He traces it all the way back to Jesus' beginning in heaven in relationship with the Father. And that can be a little nuanced because he doesn't call him Jesus in the first 18 verses. He calls him the Word, the Logos, as it's recorded in Greek. And so uh, we'll walk through what that means today and then we'll get through to the simplest, clearest version as we continue in the next 12 weeks together. Here's what John says as his gospel begins. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. John starts by by giving this title to Jesus as the Word. I said already it's the Greek word logos, and that's a, a title or a word that had meaning to everybody in the first century world John is writing to. It was important to the Greeks in the way they understood philosophy and had unique meaning for them. And it was important to the Jewish believers and their Old Testament understandings of who God was and what his word represented to them. Uh, For instance, in the first century Greek world, logos, this understanding of the word as it's recorded, was an abstract and impersonal understanding, but it represented all reason and order. It was the word they used, word, logos, to talk about reason and order, to talk about the creative force and the source of wisdom. And as John is addressing that crowd, what they will learn from him is that John is saying, this isn't some abstract idea. The creative force and wisdom and all reason and order, they come from God who was, who was brought into the flesh in the form of Jesus. It's not abstract and impersonal. It's living and embodied in our God. Come to the flesh with us. As the Jews understood the word of God, they understood it as the source of divine power and wisdom. They see that it was through the word that God created, that it was through words that he covenanted with Abraham and with David, that it was through words that he delivered the Ten Commandments, that it was through his word that he gave revelation of the prophets of who he was and he asked that to be then spoken to his people so we would understand who he was. And so this understanding of logos, of word, is important to the Jewish people. And again, what John is saying is, this isn't about a, an audible voice that comes from a mountaintop or from heaven or can only be found in the Holy of Holies in the temple. This is about 
Jesus coming and embodying God's power and wisdom in the flesh. Jesus was in the beginning and the word and Jesus was with God. That's the way it translates in almost every translation. And and it makes sense. It's the correct meaning of the language, but we miss some of the nuance. You see, I can be with people, and we can see that as a geographic understanding. I rode on the bus with a hundred people. I was with them. And we can mean that geographically. They were in the same place together. And yet the Greek gives far more nuance to that. The original language John was writing wants us to have a different picture as we're picturing what he's saying here. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. Maybe better translated for a picture in our head would be and the word was and Jesus was face to face in intimate relationship and discussion with God. They weren't just merely present together. They're in deep, committed relationship. They're with each other in that way. And they always have been before the foundations of the earth, predating creation of the world. They were together. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. It goes on then to say of what Jesus' behaviors and actions, what his role was in playing in some of that in verse 3. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. The simplest version of that understanding for us is a physical one. For us to understand that it is through Jesus that we were made. Without Jesus, I, I wouldn't be alive. You wouldn't be alive. Jesus was I- integral in the creation of all things, and nothing that has been formed or made would have been made without Jesus. We owe our physical being to Jesus. John's setting the stage for what he's going to make true for the next 21 chapters of the book, which is, and we weren't just physically created by Jesus. We owe our spiritual birth to Jesus as well. As we have distorted what we were supposed to be as God's creation, our ability to be face-to-face with God, to come into right, intimate relationship with Him, happens also because of Jesus. He has enabled us to exist physically. He also is what enables us, through His death and resurrection, to exist spiritually. It goes on talking about who Jesus is In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus was the source of life, and as we look at the life of all mankind and see light in it, that is Jesus on display, that light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Last fall, we did a series together called Light in the Dark. Where we talked about Jesus' mission for his people as he gathers his crowd, as he starts his church. It's to be an assembly of people who are promoting who Jesus is and are storming the gates of hell with the gates of hell not able to overcome it. That we're to go and be light in the dark. And as I finished one of the sermons during that series, uh, one of you came up to me. I don't right now remember who it was, but one of you came up to me and said, oh, I had a great illustration for what that looks like, for light going into darkness and what that looks like. It was used uh, as a Sunday school illustration, primarily for kids. And you told me about it, and I just want you to know, thank you, because since then I've used it in multiple different environments and want to share it with everybody today, just an understanding of what, what light and darkness and conflict with each other looks like. And so let's assume for the moment that we have a closed box, sealed and closed and filled with just empty darkness. Nothing else in the box. I can shake it and there's nothing inside of it. And you may not be able to see this super well, but uh, right now there's a hole in it that I can peer through and look in and see that the box is literally filled with darkness. And the question that you could then pose, if this was a Sunday school illustration for small kids, is to ask What do we think is going to happen when I open the box? Will the box stay filled with darkness? Will the darkness escape into the room and the room become dark because it has been freed from the box? What will happen 
when the box is opened. I think most of us, if we're not children, know the answer to this. It's that when the box is opened and the light enters, the darkness ceases to be there. The light overcomes the darkness. And while we recognize that true as a a box and with sources of light hitting it, I want to just simply ask the question, do you recognize it's true with your life? I don't know what's going on, but parts of your life may feel like they're filled with darkness right now. Parts of the story you're living may be distant from what you would hope it to be. Parts of the way the news hits feels like the world is headed towards darkness. Do we recognize that we always have opportunity for an invitation of the light of the world to come to that? And that when that happens, the darkness doesn't ever win. Light always wins. We invite Jesus as the light that is the life of all mankind. And when he comes, he comes and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness won't overcome it. If you find darkness in your life right now, invite Jesus into those spaces so that the light he offers rules instead. Stop trying to work it out on our own. Invite Jesus to bring his light into those circumstances as he does time and time again, faithful to what he said he will do. And the gospel moves from its understanding of Jesus in heaven and predating creation and talking about how it'll engage with the world to talk about what that was going to look like and how there's a precursor to that. And verse 6 says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. This is referencing John the Baptist, not the author of the gospel. And he came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. We'll see that John the Baptist, he's recorded a number of stories in the Gospel of John where he comes to to point us to who Jesus is, to point that first century world he was engaging with to who Jesus is, that one would come that would be light for the world, that one would come to redeem and restore, and he was making witness of who that is. And we get to watch as, as he deals with some of that conflict. Some of his disciples in chapter three see Jesus baptizing some people. And they come to John the Baptist and they say, hey, you're the one that baptizes people. Should we go tell this guy he's supposed to stop? Or should we go tell him he needs to do this somewhere else? Because this is kind of your thing. Isn't this about you? What do you want us to do? John the Baptist will again say, no, 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 this isn't about me. It was never about me. It is always about Jesus. And we see some of my favorite words in Scripture as John the Baptist is talking about those things. He says things. In chapter 3, he says things like, no, as, as it matters for the world and as it matters for my own life, he, Jesus, must increase. We don't need to try to rush him out. We don't need to tell him to stop doing anything. He must increase. I must decrease. It's that kind of narrative that's found in the Gospel of John and not in the other Gospels as we see more of the dialogue and more of the narrative stories take place that way. John came to let everybody know it's all about Jesus. He needs to increase and we need to decrease. Because verse 9 says, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. Not just a part of creation Not just part of setting the relationship with God through his old covenant in place. Jesus was going to come in the flesh. He was going to leave the face-to-face intimacy with God the Father. And he was going to come and dwell with us. He was going to bring light to everyone by coming into the world. And that was supposed to be gloriously received by all of us and by all of creation. And yet that's far from the story that played out as sin had broken the world. Instead, we see, as verse 10 records it, he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own didn't receive him. It's unfortunately an all too familiar story that the people Jesus came for don't recognize him 
they don't receive him, they discount him, we'll see played out through the gospel of John, they end up killing him. And while we don't necessarily have the same physical opportunity to interact with Jesus in the flesh, we have the same opportunity to recognize him in the world around us, and the same opportunity to receive him, and yet much of our world doesn't. He's come for us. He's given light to the world. He did it in the flesh. He's given us the model of by which to live. And we look at the world around us and say, but it's so dark and it's missing it. And so the question again that's asked of us, do we recognize Jesus? Do we recognize him in our lives as he's at work? Do we recognize him in the lives of the people we interact with? Do we see him at work in our world on a large scale, not just a personal scale? Do you recognize Jesus at work? How, how can we attune ourselves to his footsteps and join him in now? And then receive what he offers It's not just about knowing who Jesus is. Again, John's purpose in writing was that we would believe and have life in him. It's not just about us seeing and understanding Jesus. It's not just about what we recognize. That other version in verse 11 says that we would receive him. There's blessing and benefit that comes from that. And some in the first century, and hopefully all of us listening today, have done just that. Verse 12 continues, yet to all who did receive him, and I hope that's us, I hope that's you. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of a natural descent or of a human decision or of a husband's will, but born of God. As we receive him, we get to have that face-to-face with God kind of relationship, not just the, ah, we're generally in the environment. We get to have intimate, intimate face-to-face relationship with God. As we believe and as we receive Jesus, we get to be in right relationship with God the Father. We get to become heirs and part of the family. And so my hope and prayer for you is that you'd recognize Jesus in your life. You'd recognize him in the lives of those around you. You'd recognize him in our world. And more than just recognizing and understanding and having knowledge of Jesus, you would receive him. And as you receive him, you would be filled with light. and Darkness would flee and you would begin to live out the life Jesus has for you. Life is the child of God. As John continues, he tries to summarize it as clearly as possible. This word, the word, Jesus, became flesh, and he made his dwelling among us. We've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus left heaven and became flesh. He came and dwelled with us. A clear statement to say that the divine left heaven and became divine here in our midst Not simply fulfilling messianic prophecies, though he does that. He comes not just as a person to fulfill those prophecies. He comes as God in the flesh to fulfill the need for humanity. The word Jesus became flesh. Fully God and fully man at the same time. We've been able to see him. He came to us full of grace and truth. John gives a footnote to how John the Baptist spoke of this, saying, John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. He's not simply another man who's come. This one is far superior to any of us, far superior to me. He, pre- he came after me, but he also predated me. He has forever existed. He is fully divine. He is the one who has come. This is who I'm spoken about. Spoken about. It is all about Jesus. It is always about Jesus. We want to foundationally set ourselves on who Jesus is. And here's why. Verse 16 continues, because out of his fullness, not only have we become children of God, but out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of a grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. 
There was an old covenant that Moses had delivered on behalf of God for his people to recognize that when there was brokenness in their life, they could make atonement through some sacrifices and there was a system set in place so we knew how to live in right relationship with God while he was not in the flesh. But as Jesus came, he came to reveal God more clearly. He came to put a new covenant in place, a covenant that extends grace on top of the grace we've already had extended through the law. A grace in place of grace that's already been given. A fullness of grace and truth that comes not from the law, but comes through Christ and through Christ alone. Throughout the summer, we studied through the book of Romans together. And a couple of times, you may have heard me use the phrase, the new covenant means it's time to give up on law-based religion. What Jesus institutes is a grace and relationship-based, faith-based religion, not a law-based one. Jesus comes and offers a grace that replaces the grace that was offered by the law and offers truth that's beyond the truth that was summed up in just law. He clarifies and more fully represents who God is and what God wants as God comes to us in the flesh. Summing it all up before beginning his narrative stories then, John says, no one has ever seen God But the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in close relationship with the Father, has made him known. The clearest revelation we have of God we get from the person, the divine person of Jesus Christ. Who has seen and been face to face with God the Father and left that to dwell in the flesh in our midst to reveal God fully to us. Over the course of the next 12 weeks, we're going to watch as John gives the simplest versions of the stories to show the signs that Jesus was God, to show the signs that Jesus was who he says he was, and to make clear we have foundational understanding of what that means for us and why life placed in him is worthwhile. And I'm excited about what we'll discover in that. John says he does that so that we would be people who believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing we would have life in his name. And so my hope is that you believe and my hope is that you have life in his name. But if you're anything like me, you often have a picture of what that life is supposed to be, what being a fully transformed, living out righteousness and holiness disciple looks like, and you would recognize, at least I do, that there is a gap between who I am and the perfection God calls me to in living as his child. I recognize I'm not fully the disciple I'm supposed to be, and I hope you might recognize you're not fully the disciple you're supposed to be yet either. We are justified before God because of what Christ has done. That is true and always true simply because of what Jesus has done. But then the hope of who we would be as we have life in that is a deep pursuit of what he has for us. I'm also aware that I'll never preach a perfect sermon that will somehow fix that for all all of us or never find the perfect application or spiritual discipline for us to put in place where we suddenly out of one moment just become the people God longs for us to be. That it is a lifelong process that we call sanctification A lifelong process of following Jesus and doing better each day at it that grows us into the people God longs for us to be. And as such, I want to begin offering throughout this entire series and likely extending beyond it, new opportunity for us. Ideas of what we can do going forward to apply, to put into practice what we've studied and learned from God's word together, and recognizing that we might not fully become everything God wants from us yet, but we'll start with at least a step. You'll hear me ask a question for the next season, every week. What's your one? What is the one step you can take this week to to get further in your discipleship, to get closer to the right relationship with God as expressed in your life, to develop into the child of God or the disciple of God that he is calling you to be? What is your one? And each week, my goal will be to give you some options, some ideas, not as the right ideas, but potential ideas you may want to put into practice. And because of the church, our values are connecting and growing and participating I'll aim to give ideas in each of those areas. Here's examples for this week. 
You may this week decide that your one step of applying this message is to connect with someone else. And you may do that by asking them what signs or truth about Jesus is most significant to them. And sharing what signs or truth about Jesus are most significant to you. John says there's lots of signs and those signs are there so we would believe. Which ones are most important to you as your belief plays out? And maybe you'll choose to connect with someone. That's a value of scripture by asking them. Maybe you don't like that as your idea for taking one step this week. And so you'll choose to to grow in your relationship with God in a unique way as well. And so maybe this week, instead, you'll choose to memorize John chapter 20, verse 31, the, the purpose by which he writes the gospel. And you'll memorize the phrasing, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Maybe growing is what you want to do, and that's not the verse. Maybe instead you want to choose that clear declaration of Jesus' divinity, and you choose to memorize John 1.14. Again, there's not a right answer. My hope is that you'll choose one or create one and put one thing into practice. Maybe you're looking to participate in in expanding God's kingdom. And as we understand that he came as light and that his light doesn't overcome the world, maybe you'll participate by celebrating and encouraging with your words the light and the life that you see in others. You see, these things aren't always clear categories, connecting and growing and participating, because that celebration and encouragement might be connection and not just participation. Or maybe you'll choose none of these three, and your one will be going to our website and reaching out to a small group leader to engage in relationship with them. And that is a step of connection. It's a step of growth. It's a step of participation. But it's one thing you can do. You'll notice we've used some graphics around some of that language in the examples this week. Our intention then is to be able to remind you throughout the week. And so like on things like our Facebook page that we would uh, put out this week's options that were given. But really the heart is that we would encourage you to pick one thing you can do this week. One thing, one step you can take and put into practice to express your life and your faith in Christ and to grow closer as a disciple or child of his. My hope and my prayer is that God would lead you in that process and transform you through the best steps you can take. And I want to pray to that end. Would you join me in that prayer? God, we're thankful. Thankful for Jesus who comes to reveal to us most clearly who you are. Who comes not just as a man to fulfill prophecies, but comes as God in the flesh. Living with us, bringing the light to all of us. We're thankful for opportunity we've had to recognize and receive him and pray that as we do so, we'd become your children, your heirs. We'd get access to -to face-to-face intimate relationship with you and that the grace extended through his death and resurrection would be the grace that sustains us. We pray as we go forward throughout this week, focused on the foundational understanding of Jesus being revealed to us that we would that we would become more the people you long for us to be help us to do that in whatever step it means we take be in that as your spirit guides us through it we pray in Jesus name amen i'm thankful that you were able to join us in worship this morning in honoring and glorifying God in studying his word together. I'm thankful for your grace and understanding as plans had to shift a little bit um, because of the health conditions that surround our environment at this moment. And I'm thankful uh, for your continued uh, participation with us as we look toward engaging again next weekend in person and digitally as has been planned coming into this season. Thanks for being with us. Grace and peace to you as you enjoy the rest of your day.